Okay, next let's talk about specialization and inbreeding, right? First, let's talk about specialization. As organisms select more and more for specific traits that were deemed fit for their environment, they become more specialized in a specific task. For example, many of us know about the finch as Darwin observed, uh, which inspired his theory of evolution. Now they all had different beaks um, for eating different kinds of food. Some were for nuts, some were for seeds, some were for uh, fruits. Um, they all had different beaks that were specialized for different tasks. Um, that, and these tasks were things that other finches with different types of beaks could not really do as well because they weren't specialized for it. Um, and generally, as traits are more fit, they're usually going to become more specialized, but sometimes some adaptation may be too unspecialized, right? For example, a species of finch that can only eat nuts due to their beak might may over time develop, uh, adapt to develop a more generalist beak capable of eating fruits and seeds, as well as the cause of not being as effective as opening nuts. This could happen if, for example, there's like a nut shortage or they change environments to one where there's uh, no nuts or there's like another animal that um, is introduced into the island, new species that's introduced to the island um, that also eats nuts and they kind of have competition for this food source now. So it's not as effective to just focus on this one food source now and they have to branch out um, over time many of the birds of the finches that only eat nuts will die off because they don't have enough food. Whereas um, the ones that have more, that develop more generalized beaks will kind of be able to get some fruit and some seeds as well, and they won't die off and they'll reproduce more often. And that trait will be more selected for. Okay, this is kind of like um, an example of the finches. So this is uh, the different like classifications, tree finches, warblers, ground finches, um, there's the different types of bills that they have, or uh, yeah, bills or beaks or whatever um, they're called. And this is what they, these beaks are specialized in eating. So the grasping and the probing are for insects. These are for seeds. These are for fruits. And you can see how they're all mildly different. Okay. Okay. Next, let's talk about inbreeding versus outbreeding. Inbreeding refers to mating between partners that share a close genetic relation, like for example, siblings, cousins, um, things like that, like a close um, yeah, genetic relationship or like blood relationship. Generally, from a genetic standpoint, it's very risky and often it's offspring with many defects as compared to outbreeding, which is um, what we consider um, normal mating, um, which bring between partners with little to no genetic relation. That's kind of like more um, accepted and more like standard for us, um, at least, but, and there is a reason for it is because inbreeding is generally not, like I said, very risky from a genetic standpoint. Um, while this does go against certain aspects of selection and adaptation, for example, as crosses between siblings would yield an increased chance of offspring inheriting a selected trait. So if, if we're going to talk about like finch, for example, if they had this like uh, the brown, the cactus brown finch, which had this like cactus eating um, finch and then you needed to develop that um, and get that going because <clears throat> you needed to select for that. Um, <clears throat> sorry, you needed to select for that because um, there's an abundance of cactus and not a lot of other foods and you need to develop that. Um, it would make sense for siblings maybe uh, that have this trait from their parents to maybe mate with each other so that their offspring, they could have a lot of offspring which have this cactus eating bill and they their offspring would be more fit and more likely to survive, but, but there are many other drawbacks that actually make this much, make this more riskier than beneficial, right? So one big risk factor with inbreeding is mutations in an ancestor. Like mentioned in a lot of previous lectures, mutations occur much more often than you may expect. Um, our, we re, our cells reproduce a lot. And because of that, they have to go through a lot of DNA replication which is prone to making mistakes. We have a very good um, proofreading uh, system to make sure there's not a lot of mistakes, but with how much we reproduce over the course of a lifetime, you're gonna make a lot of mistakes. You're gonna have a lot of mutations um, in your cells. And that's why as people get older, the risks for like, things like genetic disease, like cancer, uh, diabetes, um, a lot of like heart condition, like, a lot of that stuff increases because over time, uh, <clears throat> your DNA gets more damaged and more damaged and more damaged. And now it's not producing what it needs to produce as well anymore, or it's producing too much of something or something like that. 
Um, and sometimes um, if these occur in a germ, a germ cell, um, they can get passed down to offspring. So if you have, for example, a mutation in your, when you're 50 in your liver, there's no risk of your kids getting this genetic disorder, right, from you. If you have that mutation that developed in 50. But if you have a mutation that occurred in a germ cell in like, and then, and for example, like in your sperm, and then that uh, was used to uh, create a child, that child would then have that mutation that occurred in you, right? And this is why things like we do genetic analysis to determine um, which kit, which people have like mutations and whatnot that they could pass down to their kids. Um, this is not, this is typically not a huge issue if the mutation is masked or diluted with the wild type or unmutated or a healthier version of that gene from the other parent. However, because you get, remember one copy of your gene, of every gene from your mother, one from your father. If your mother had a mutation in hers and you, all of your genes from your mother have this mutation in your body, um, but all of the ones from your father are perfectly fine, they work perfectly, they can kind of like mask it or dilute it, and it's generally not as bad. And you only become like a carrier of that mutation from your mother. You don't actually express that mutation. However, if both of your parents have that mutation, which is often the case when your parents are siblings, um, then the, there's a much more increased chance of the offspring will suffer a birth defect. And this can happen even if your parents are not related. Um, they, and this, is, this does happen often, but, or re relatively often because there's a lot of um, mating that's without relation, um, without close relations, I should say. But um, even, it's much less likely to happen if it's just two random people. Statistically, it's much less likely to happen if it's just two random people um, than if it's two people who are related. Because if they're related, that means they got it from your grandfather. And if they both got it from your grandfather, then you most likely have it. Uh, they'll both most likely have it. You'll, and then they'll most likely pass it on to you. And even if you don't express it, um, again, if you may continue mating with your sister or your cousin or whoever, um, close relation, it'll get passed down more and more and more and more. And it builds up, it builds up, and eventually, pretty much there's a high likelihood that all of your kids will have it. Um, some common birth defects that may uh, develop include developmental defects, um, limb malformations, like um, we uh, call it like a club foot, um, stillbirth and miscarriages, so the kids might not even be born, sterile offspring who may not have their own, uh, be able to have their own children because um, they have either three chromosome, uh, three uh, X chromosomes or something like that, or there's some kind of um, chromosome misalignment or something like that. There's many, many others, right, that could happen. Um, for example, like diabetes and things like that, type one. Um, there's plenty of um, bad mutations that could happen uh, due to the inbreeding. This is a common picture of somebody that you probably have heard of. Uh, this is uh, King Tut, who was an Egyptian pharaoh. Um, this is a recreation of what he looked like based on genetic analysis. Um, he's, I think, in this picture, supposed to be like about like in his teens, so, like he's like 16, 17. Um, so you can see he has very weak body, um, club foot. Um, he has, he had, assumedly, we assume uh, developmental defects, um, as well as many other um, defects. And that's because his parents were, I think, either siblings or cousins or something like that. And among the pharaohs, this was inbreeding was very common because they wanted to like keep the bloodline pure, um, but it obviously backfired. And he had a lot of um, malformations and defects because of that. Another result of inbreeding, which could be considered positive or negative, depending on the situation, is the enhancement of certain traits. Again, as the traits among close relations are very similar, certain um, traits will get passed out much more commonly and some continuous traits, ones that have um, continuous traits are ones that have like a sliding scale rather than a yes, no. Um, for example, um, height, skin, pigmentation, et cetera, those are continuous traits, right? And these will be enhanced from generation to generation. So for example, if two very tall siblings were to inter inbreed, their offspring would also be very tall. The process continued among offspring for generations. Again, sibling, 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 sibling. Um, many generations later, the end result will be descendants who are much taller than their ancestors, assuming no birth defects, um, again, which is unlikely. 
um, after that many generations of inbreeding, it's very unlikely that they won't have some kind of birth defects that will actually like might hinder their growth or may um, hinder some other aspect that they might even die or, or be sterile, um, which is unlikely, but this could happen and they'll be very tall. Most common example of this in history is actually, it's called the Habsburg chin. Um, after many generations of inbreeding in the Royal Habsburg family of Austria and Spain, which had a pronounced chin, ultimately led um, to a man named King Charles II of Spain, who is like the most well-known um, person with this deformity or this trait, I should say. Um, but I guess to his, to his extent, it, it's a, kind of like a deformity. Um, this is kind of what he looked like. And you can see like he has a very malformed chin. And like, it was to the point where he couldn't even like, he had to like swallow his food whole because he couldn't chew and he had trouble speaking. And he had a lot of problems because of this. And the way this started was, again, there was a lot of incest among the, the royal family, keep the royal life pure. But um, for example, one person had a, um, like a more pronounced chin, like not to his extent, but a little bit. And then they made it with their sister or cousin or, or whatever, who also had that same chin, but again, not as extreme. Their kid also had that, um, maybe to an even more extent, a little bigger extent. Um, their offspring had that, they made it again. And it kept going, kept going, kept going, and yet more and more and more pronounced because the trait kept getting passed on and on and on. Okay, and eventually it led to this.